afternoon. Um, I am, I think I don't have particularly good internet. Um, I am Wendy Randall, um, one of the consultant midwives at the John Radcliffe. I think I might be live now. Um, so good afternoon, I'm Wendy Randall. Um, I'm one of the consultant midwives at the John Radcliffe Hospital. Um, and I come to uh, talk to you today um, about what's been happening um, in the maternity services um, during this pandemic um, in terms of what's been happening in terms of visiting partners for support. Um, so, you know, we, we work very closely with our stakeholder group, so talking to Maternity Voices Partnership, um, input from um, doulas, um, input from um, uh, some surveys that we've done internally in terms of what it has been like for you um, to experience the pandemic as, as pregnant women or women who've just given birth. Um, and actually, we just wanted to share with you some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes because we did want to reassure you and we do want to reassure you that um, we are constantly looking at what happens, um, trying to work out, you know, when we can get back to normal um, uh, and whether there is a new normal. Um, and so it's really important for us to try and have um, as much input with you as possible. Um, I'm going to try and make my screen bigger. One of my problems is um, uh, technology is not fantastic um, because everything decides not to work at the wrong time. I promise it's not that I can't use it. Um, so. The, um, the key things that I wanted to um, visit with you today are we had our quarterly meeting um, with the Maternity Voices Partnership on Wednesday um, and you'll be aware they've had out surveys asking for your feedback. Um, you know, what do you think about the services? Um, what do you think um, we could do better? And sort of where your anxieties are really. Um, and um, we wanted to let you know that you know what we were doing about that so we were very much aware um that um you know the ideal is that you are supported throughout your pregnancy journey antenatally um in labor and and afterwards um the coronavirus has meant that we've had to make some changes to your antenatal care so not all of your appointments um have been able to be face to face um, and some have been over telephone and, and with that um, and the changes to service, unfortunately, some appointments have been missed. Um, we found that some women haven't been coming forwards for aspects of care because they're concerned about coronavirus and exposure. Um, uh, we're aware that you know people haven't had as long. Um, there have been re some restrictions and when women initially come into the unit um, for assessment. Um, what happens in labour, what happens afterwards on the ward and that key time for a family afterwards. So we really just wanted to talk about sort of what we've heard and what we're doing about it. Um, and, and this is on a national picture and it's something that we talk about to try and learn from other units as well. And we appreciate that different units are doing different things, which again is very, um, causes a lot of uncertainty and unrest um, for women because it is about trying to understand why why it's different in Oxford when maybe down the road in, in Reading or Buckinghamshire hospitals it might be different uh, or you have family friends in London and it's different there. Um, so very much um, uh, NHS England, Public Health England, our Royal Colleges, whether it's obstetricians and gynaecologists or Royal College midwives, um, they've all come together and created a paper that said, you know, you should, um, it was published uh, last week on the 8th of September and it's very much saying organisations need to think about how they are going back to normal. Um, and, and honestly, um, since we were going into these um, mechanisms of things we had to do in March in response to COVID, we also had to have, um, we also started having the discussions about how we're going to recover um, afterwards and what we're going to be able to do. So it is, I just wanted to share with you, it's, it's an evolving picture. It's something we have uh, regular meetings about. I mean, we used to have meetings five times a week um, on COVID uh, with less and less changing. We've reduced that, but we're still having at least one meeting a week where we're looking at the service and how it's changing. Um, and that's one week with a 
with the bigger team, but there are individual conversations happening in each area to try and look at can we make changes um, in each area. So I suppose the, the things that we've, um, the things that this document, um, has, the guidance that we're getting from Public Health England are they have made suggestions, but they have also identified that there are many things that organisations need to take into consideration um, when they are making changes. Um, and ideally, you don't want to make changes that then have to be revoked if there's a local or a national lockdown. Um, so it's about sustainability of changes as well, because there's nothing worse than than making um, big changes and then finding that that you're having to reverse those. Um, so the uh, the big uh, the changes uh, that we are thinking about and have been talking about. Um, are in response to the feedback that we've been given. So um, uh, I wanted to share with you the things that we've done um, along the way um, uh, so that you know um, where we're coming from. And of course, just as I made my screen bigger, everything else disappeared on me. Um, so the things that we have always done, which may be different from other organisations, is we've always felt it was incredibly important for you to have a birthing partner with you. Um, it is about um, making sure that at that time when you're birthing your baby and um, um, when you're in labour and at the point of the birth, that, that uh, you have somebody with you that you've chosen to support you. Uh, I appreciate that's been stressful for people who have wanted more than one person. Um, but we, we also have to think about the exposure um, uh, to our staff of more uh, individuals um, uh, as part of the package of care. Um, the, we have ha made um, some alterations along the way in terms of our pathway. So um, there have been key individuals who it's been incredibly important that, um, that we haven't separated from them partner and that's for those um, those families that um, have suffered a bereavement um, because again nationally a lot of organisations are doing similar things it is at a time where there is even more stress upon a family and at that time that we need to support them um, and we do have um, some women with very significant mental health issues um, where um, the, the presence of a birth partner has helped to keep them at a level um, and we've worked with our psychiatrists on, on identifying who are the key people uh, that we can help. Because again, we appreciate that there is a variance in terms of people's mental health status and again, some people have felt, well, why is my mental health different from, from somebody else's? Um, so they're the main areas that we focused on at the beginning of COVID. You know, you're all aware the rates obviously were very high. Um, we had issues with staff having to be at home and self-isolating. Um, and um, there was lots of concern in the, um, as you may feel, um, there's lots of people in community really concerned about, you know, going to shops, having extra contact at risk of infection. And if you are feeling that, then it is about us explaining that our staff were feeling like that as well. You know, they were frightened. They may be cared for um, vulnerable people, older relatives, um, uh, people who are recovering from cancer or various medical treatments um, and or had significant issues about their health that although they could work, actually becoming unwell with the virus would have uh, would have been very life threatening for them. So, so we've had to. We're we're trying to look after you as you're trying to look after yourself and families. And we're trying to look after the staff, because the more staff that we have that are at home because they can't come to work means that we can't offer the kind of service that we want to be able to um, offer in Oxford. So we've really kept our screening pathway much as it is uh, to the best to keep you as safe as possible, um, and we've we've continued to provide a really good service. Um, including exceptional um, uh, abilities to enable women to birth in the community at midwifery-led units and home births, uh, which I know a lot of organisations have struggled with um, and have closed those services. So by, by being very clever um, about what we're doing and about uh, some of the restrictions that have been in place, it's to enable a, a bigger, better service um, to be available to you all. So getting uh, down to the, the changes that we've made, 
um, you know, as the uh, coronavirus levels started to get uh, less um, in um, uh, in our local population. Um, and as we were able to get more testing for staff, more swabs so that people could get back to work quicker, um, it was very positive and we started to think that we could make some changes. So the biggest uh, bit of feedback that we were getting through Maternity Voices Partnership, who is your biggest voice at present, um, was about the presence of partners at SCAN. Um, and so um, we spent, uh, you know, sort of, um, July, June, July, going through um, uh, going through our scan departments. Uh, some of our scan departments have uh, waiting rooms that are part of an antenatal clinic, for example, in in Banbury, um, and um, we looked and mapped out, you know, the the size of the scan rooms, how we'd be able to socially distance if we um, if partners could come back into the hospital. Um, so that was, um, I'm sure you'll appreciate, was quite a, a big bit of work. Um, but um, and it took some time and planning in terms of the scan department. We were quite uh, a lot of our um, we had reduced numbers of scan um, ultrasonographers who could do the scans as well, and so it was quite um, tricky. We had to reduce our scanning. Uh, we we weren't able to do all thirty six weeks scans at some point, but we were in, able to introduce that quite quickly. Um, we also. Um, we also had plans in terms of um, at that time we were reintroducing um, an hour's visiting per staff um, coming into the hospital. If you hold on just a minute, my, I think somebody wants into the room. Bear with me. I'm in. Um, apologies for that. Um, the lovely Raj is just making sure that we're all stocked up. Um, yeah, so as, as we were doing the piece of work about scans, reintroducing 36 week scans, trying to work out um, clinic sizes and um, how people can wait for scans to uh, maintain social distancing. Um, we had uh, we were we started to introduce one hour of visiting um, per day uh, for women who are inpatients on our antenatal ward and postnatal ward. Um, Initially, uh, due to security within the unit and managing the doors, uh, we were only able to have a volunteer to help us um, manage the doors Monday to Friday um, um, because we needed um, extra security checking. We needed to make sure that um, you know we could manage the amount of people coming in and out of the lifts. Um, I don't know if you all appreciate that there are no public stairs um, uh, between uh, level two um, which is where you come in in maternity and the um, and the levels uh, level five where the postnatal ward is level six um, where the antenatal ward is and level seven which has some postnatal care and the spires so because there is no um, uh, public stairs for you to be able to walk up the stairs we needed to be able to manage people that were coming into our lifts um, and we are only able to allow two people in the lift at a time which meant that you couldn't have lots of people um, waiting about and um, being able to manage social distancing. So initially uh, we started Monday to Friday and we did that at the end of June. Um, and then um, by the 18th of July, we'd managed to find a volunteer that would help us at the weekend to enable visiting to happen then as well. Um, so I appreciate for people that was quite hard um, and some of the feedback that we've had from Maternity Voices Partnership has been that hour has been quite difficult because if people have had to wait for the lift um, or had, it's taken them a bit longer to ha have somebody let them in or come upstairs um, that they've had reduced time um, in that hour to be able to visit. So of course that is something that we're taking into consideration. Uh, we were also hindered by technology. We had our lift broke one of our lifts, so we then only had one lift um, and it was very difficult to trying to get somebody um, to come in to repair the lift, um, which is astounding, but it is one of the features of the pandemic. Um, so um, in response to um, then, you know, women again, um, we're finding the diff, you know, if they had to be um, on the wards for a longer period of time, especially postnatally after the baby's born, that's such an acute time when you want to spend time as a family. Um, one hour of visiting felt like it wasn't enough. So um, I think 
by, I'm just checking my notes, by about the 18th of August, we were able to, uh, to enable people uh, to come twice a day uh, for an hour each time um, to stay on the ward. And, and I think that's very difficult for people because they, you know, it's that understanding of what does that mean? If I, why can't I, if I come in at one point, can't I stay until the next point when I will be able to come back and visit? But again, that's, you know, uh, appreciating the, the volume of people that we can have on the ward. I mean, we can have 40 plus mums and 40 plus babies on the ward. Um, and we have predominantly four bedded bays. Um, and what we have to do is, um, you know, if everybody's partners all came and stayed all day, that would be uh, eight people in a, in a very small bay. Um, and and obviously then it's trying to maintain that social distancing. So what we have tried to do is stagger the appointments so that everybody isn't in together um, uh, so that we're not then exposing you or your partner, um, well, your partner mainly to, to other people coming through. And that is going to be a challenge um, postnatally and one that we are absolutely looking for. Um, and even in terms of people that are feeling very vulnerable, we've heard that twin women, uh, twin women, sorry, women who are having twins feel especially vulnerable because they have two babies um, and wanting a bit more help. Um, and so we, we are listening to that and feeding that into the, the new changes um, that we are hoping to make um, over the forthcoming weeks and months. Um, the um, the other thing that we've heard in terms of women is uh, is that uh, time uh, after you've had the birth and it, and people seem to be having very different experiences. Um, some people um, are going home within an hour of giving birth, um, and other people are, um, are are getting an, a little bit longer depending on what's happening on the ward. Um, and so we're very, very much aware of that. Um, and what we're trying to do is look at um, where you give birth, the time that you give birth, and whether there's possibility to make that longer. The key thing that makes a difference for us is that changeover of staff, because it is about um, that, that group of people. So the midwife that looks after you um, when you birth your baby, whether you're birthing your baby um, at... Um, in on our delivery suite or say our spires where I am just now, um, you have a, a cohort of staff who will have looked after you and you will have been exposed to them, they will have been exposed to you and between you we can work out that bubble. So if one of you was contacted by Public Health England Track and Trace and said um, uh, that you've been in contact with somebody who's been positive, we're able to just look at that smaller bubble and say okay that's potentially um, four members of staff that we need to, to uh, make sure are self-isolating at home until we can get them a COVID swab um, and whether they test positive or not. So if I explain then in terms of the journey, so an example would be if you had birthed your baby on delivery suite, if you were, if you had two midwives, a maternity support worker had been with you during the birth of your baby, perhaps you might have seen another midwife as well. So you and your partner have, have been in that bubble with them. If we then said, okay, well, you, now you're going up to our postnatal ward and your partner were to follow you up to that postnatal ward, for example, going up to level five, there can be five or six midwives on shift on that day, there can be two or three um, maternity support workers, there can be the infant feeding team, there can uh, there are nurses there as well that support us um, on that ward. So you start to see that that's a whole other different group of people. So if, um, if your partner happened to be contacted by Track and Trace or one of our midwives was contacted by Track and Trace, you can imagine that mixing those together, the more people creates more people that potentially have to stay at home and self-isolate um, until we can get a test result to see whether they're positive or not. So that's why we, we have, we're very careful about how we make decisions about who is, is, uh, is going to be there, who is coming next and, and moving people from one area to another because it is about um, that exposure. And, and what we don't want to do is, is lose staff going home um, for self-isolating if there's something we could have done to avoid it. I mean, clearly we want to reduce the chance of, of people having infections so they will self-isolate. 
um, and I'm sure you're all aware from the um, information that's been on the news that it has been more difficult to get swabs and people are talking about having to travel a long way to get swabs and to get results. Um, we are, are fortunate in Oxford that we're supported to get a swab um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, but again, we're waiting, uh, you know, it could be 24, 40 hours, um, depending on capacity going through the lab at the time, um, for us to get those results. And in that time, those, those members of staff can't come back to work. So clearly, if they're not at work, there's then aspects of their care that they were due to do at work that we have to try and get covered by other people, um, which means that then there are possibly aspects of care that we can't provide to other people. So I suppose it's just that knock-on effect that I really wanted to, um, to explain to you because these are all the things that we have to take into consideration before we make changes. So I, I know from your perspective, from being a, you know, from using our services, requiring our services, that it is frustrating um, and that you really want your partner to be there and you really want, um, you want us to start in, introducing more visitors um, and we absolutely are listening to you and we are trying our best. Um, so I've already had two meetings this morning um, thinking about how we are going to um, reintroduce services. Um, and with that, I have to look at what the local levels are doing in terms of uh, cases of coronavirus. Um, Oxford is no different um, to anyone else, and we have seen some peaks. Um, we are, there is a grading system in terms of colour. So there's a dark green colour, which means that's great. The levels are really very quite low. Um, it goes to lighter green if, if the levels are creeping up a bit. It goes to a, a pale yellow um, as the levels increase. It goes to amber, um, and then it goes uh, it goes to red. Um, you know, I think where we are at the minute is in the pale yellow side of things, um, with a view to there is a potential for us to go to amber, um, uh, perhaps uh, in the next week, um, and so we are obviously very anxious about that. Um, I think the thing that makes us anxious is that we're seeing um, uh, the levels of positive uh, that are happening are in younger people, um, you know, people in their late teens, 20s, 30s. They're the ones that are starting to come back positive. Um, and they are obviously the age group that would be socialising with yourselves um, predominantly. Um, and so therefore, you know, it is about a risk group. Um, I know, you know, lots of um, towns uh, and cities that have universities are anxious because the, the students are going back to university and what's that, what that's going to mean to the rates. Um, which, um, you know, so everybody is watching those rates to see what will happen. Um, so I think um, the, the visiting that we have just now, we're not anticipating any changes. So we're not, uh, we're not going to do anything this week um, and, you know, at present, uh, there might be a possibility of some change next week, but it's it's not something that um, uh, is is guaranteed at present because we do have to be very mindful of our rates. And I'm sure you want to keep the staff at work. Um, I'm I'm sure you are aware that you want midwives to look after you. Um, uh, you know, midwives, doctors. Um, maternity support workers, the infant feeding team, they all form such a massive part of your care, um, as well as, as, as other services, our pharmacy, who are going to provide the medication. You know, we have to look after everybody and make sure that everybody can stay at work. Um, and, and very sadly, um, with, um, with the schools going back and um, a lot of us have children, we've seen a big increase um, over this last week, 10 days of staff having to self-isolate at home and wait um, because their children have got coughs and colds and temperatures um, and they've you know, responsibly stayed at home, followed the advice, self-isolated and got swabs. But we have seen a depletion in our staffing um, over the last 10 days. Um, we still run a very good uh, and safe service and I do want to reassure you about that, but it is something that we do have to take into consideration. So I appreciate I'm probably not sharing um, any uh, fantastic revolution of how things are going to change, um, but I felt it was so important 
um, for you to understand the kind of measures we're taking because we we are listening and when you do voice your concerns I promise we do listen I have you know we've had feedback from women themselves we've had feedback from a lot of feedback from the maternity voices partnership um, from uh, doulas who are people's birth partners um, as well as their partners um, MPs have been in touch with us so if you've been in touch with your MPs you know we're telling everybody exactly the same thing um, you can go via our patient um, advice and liaison service which is called PALS and again they have been representing some of you who've raised concerns there um, as well as birth rights um, you know the BBC want to know what we're doing um, so we are absolutely listening and we do have some plans in place but obviously if I said to you today ah oh, this is what we're going to do you know this is part of our plan and we're going to do this and then you know we have a problem in terms of uh, coronavirus rates um, and then by Monday or Tuesday we're having to change that and um, then you know we don't think that that would be um, a particularly positive thing to do um, so that's that's where we're coming from from that perspective so my most reassuring message um, and I will have a look to see if I've got any messages on the chat or questions that you have are that we are trying our best we do want to make this as positive an experience for you as possible uh, and we will try we're not going to get it right for everyone we're not at the point that we can go back to where we were before the pandemic um, and and I hope you appreciate that we want to keep you all safe um, a positive outcome for you your baby positive outcome for our staff because you know they're well and they're at work um, and um, you know I think those are all uh, great things for us to do moving forwards um, so I hope that I've been able to explain um, what's happening in the organisation and I'm just going to have a little look to see if there's any questions um, and normally I can see this so somebody's going to have to tell me if there's not um, I can't see questions. Eek. got them I'm terribly sorry um, so Melanie you've asked uh, can your partner come with you for the removal of the suture stitch um, if it's being done in the delivery suite um, Melanie I'm not quite sure um, uh, where we are with that um, in terms of uh, so in terms of our um, elective work we have to do something um, which is called a green pathway. Um, so we have, um, we've had to create an environment, um, much like some of you may be aware from, from your working environments, um, there were um, staff were graded on their level of risk because of their personal health um, or the health of somebody immediately close to them um, at the start of the pandemic. And quite a lot of people couldn't come to work. Um, because the rates have gone down and, and because of the measures, the, you know, the great hygiene measures, the wearing your face masks, and please wear them properly. It's really important that you cover your nose and your mouth. Um, but because of these measures, the rates have gone down. Uh, risk assessments have shown that these people had, could come back to work. Um, but we are taking them back to work in an environment that is um, that ha they have to be in an environment where they're at low risk of exposure to coronavirus from the health perspective. So these green pathways are areas that people can work in who perhaps have underlying health problems that they're perfectly able to work, but they, they we really need to look after them and minimise their risk of getting the virus. Um, so the, um, these green pathways are, we have to be able to put them in an environment where, where we know that somebody's coronavirus negative. So when people are going into our theatres, um, then um, so for, in terms of a planned cesarean section, we have had to change it so that these women um, uh, have a test 
uh, three days before their caesarean section. From that test, they have to self-isolate and any partner that is coming in with them has to self-isolate in that time um, so that we can ensure that the people going into theatre have the least risk possibility of having coronavirus to protect our staff that are in there. Now, in terms of a cervical suture, I'm not sure whether you're on that elective list or whether um, or whether you're coming into our general theatres on delivery suite. Um, and it is something that I will have to find out for you and post back um, for you on that point. Um, because if you are coming into our elective theatre, I presume that you would be having a COVID swab. Um, but if you're not um, and you're coming into our general theatre, then we wouldn't swab you until we came in. Uh, in which case, I don't think that your partner can be present. But um, but please, can I clarify that? And I will get Maternity Voices to post a response to that later today. So if you could please um, have a look for that later, that would be uh, that would be great. Um, Uh, so if I go to Laura question, uh, so you, uh, Laura, you were saying that you were only offered one or the other, not both visits on the 30th of August. Um, Laura, I'm not sure if that was at the point uh, that there was an issue with the lifts. Um, uh, certainly when I asked for the update from the postnatal manager, um, I, oh, um, I sadly had to be off work for six weeks myself um, mm. and was just back. Um, on uh, the 7th of September. So I wasn't actually here at that time, but at that time, um, you know, there were things that affected our ability. It may have been staffing levels, it may have been capacity in the unit. Um, you know, this is what I was trying to explain. Things aren't, they aren't set in stone. It's very difficult and sometimes things have to um, change on a daily basis. Um, I'm sorry that you didn't get as much time um, and I can assure you that I have a meeting with um, the senior team who um, who look who are um, mainly responsible for level five, level six, and level seven, so that we can discuss plans um, from Monday next week. Um, so Holly, you're saying, does this mean we can now have a visitor twice a day for one person each session? Um, so, Holly, my understanding is that yes, if your um, if your partner and and I'm under the impression it's the same partner, so it can't be your partner at one and your mother or your friend at another. So, if your partner came at one session, I'm under the impression they can come again for the following session. Um, the, the 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 difficult thing, and and I appreciate this, uh, this is difficult, and we have listened to staff about this, we've listened to women about this, is. If you um, if you have your baby, so say you had your baby today. If you uh, are going home later today, because your partner has been in with you, spent some time with you after the birth of the baby, um, then they wouldn't be able to come back and visit you that day uh, because you'd be in a different uh, area. Um, if you um, because you'd move from the delivery suite to level five or delivery suite to level seven or aspires across to level seven and um, but if you uh so if you were if you gave birth today and you were going to go home tomorrow again you'd have had your partner would have had time there was that exposure to the midwife on the day um, and then the following day your partner would be coming up to take you home um, we're trying to do everything we can to get people home quickly but again there wouldn't be the need for that visitor to come in so when you're looking at a postnatal ward that can have 40 plus women um, there will be a proportion of women that won't need to have their partner come in to visit. You'd want them to, I'm sure, but because they will be uh, meeting with their partner and they'll be going home. The visiting time is about women who have to stay in. So perhaps somebody who's had a cesarean section, um, if they birth today, they're, they're going to stay in uh, tomorrow, which is Friday, but they're going home on Saturday. That's at the point that your partner would be able to come in for those visits. Um, and again, you know, I, it's very difficult to hold and say that it's a you know, absolutely it's going to be two visits that day because I don't know how many people will be staying in. I don't know what the capacity is. Um, I don't know what the situation is in the ward, but that's what we're aiming for. Um, so we're aiming for it. 
um, and we try to deliver it where we can. And and we you know we we feel for you um, as much as you are upset. We don't we do want to do everything we can to make this positive for you. And and this this pandemic has been responsible for for many awful things happening uh, to people. Um, and we are sorry that that this has um, has affected women who are pregnant. Um, just as we're sorry for all those people that couldn't attend family funerals and couldn't go to weddings and people that couldn't have their weddings. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, affected people in all walks of life and, and we are very sorry. Uh, so Rita, um, you'd like to ask what the rationale of being allowed only one hour to visit postpartum and to stay more time. If that visitor is close to the hospital, it would be positive one or five hours. What difference does it make to reduce the visit to only one hour to prevent infection? Thank you. Um, so again, it's about, so I suppose, uh, Rita, if you were in the postnatal ward and you had your partner with you and your partner was, um, your partner was able to come um, at 10 in the morning um, and, and we obviously we can't, um, uh, so you were in, so there's 40 women and we say 40 people can come in at that time. So 40 people come in at that time, and one of those extra 40 people um, who um, who has the virus, um, then um, we find via track and trace, they've had the virus, we have to track down everybody else. So those other 39 people in the, who are in the ward and their 39 partners, um, we would have to uh, contact with because during that time that your partner was in, they would have been exposed to the midwives and because the midwives go and look after the other women, you can see that everybody um, needs to then uh, self-isolate, get swab tests um, and the impact on other families, on work environments, etc. If they come in, uh, if they come in for uh, one hour what we're doing at present is that we're trying to reduce the numbers that come in um, so it is about trying to make sure that there's not four people on in the bay at one point um, and and i hope i hope that makes sense it just becomes this big spider web of people that you have to find um, and and once we're contacted by track and trace we have to follow it and people have to self-isolate so it is about that exposure to other people um, and trying to limit um, that risk along the way. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, so we have um, Mark, do partners have to waste face uh, mask coverings at all times in the delivery suite? Um, yes, Mark, we ask them to, um, to wear face masks as a precaution. Um, we are all wearing face masks. So your midwife will wear a face mask at all time. Um, partners will wear a face mask at all time um, and we kindly, um, you know, well not kindly, but we, we made the decision not to ask a woman to wear a face mask because she is in labour um, and, um, you know, so with the face masks are about us reducing exposure um, the whole time. So I appreciate it's difficult. I mean, obviously, like, like anywhere, you can take the face mask aside to be able to drink and, and refresh but um, if you're not eating or drinking, we ask you to put it back in place. Uh, so I think it's Ella. Does the mother and partner still have to uh, self-isolate before a planned cesarean section? Um, yes, Ella, we've, we've looked at that with our microbiologists um, and what our pathway is at present, and it has changed. Um, and I know I've had conversations with people before it changed, and it was seven days and key workers could still go to work. But actually, it had to change in response to our green pathways that I was describing previously. And um, so you have a COVID swab about three days before your cesarean section. Um, from the point that you have that COVID swab, we ask you to self-isolate. We ask your partner to as well. And if your partner is a key worker, then I apologise, but they do have to self-isolate um, as well at that point. Um, um, so you, you self-isolate for the three days before. Obviously, if the test comes back positive, um, we have to review the urgency of the need for your caesarean section or induct you know, if it's an induction, if anybody has symptoms for a planned procedure, 
um, we have to review whether we can delay it or whether we have to put measures in place uh, to reduce the impact of infection spread uh, amongst other people and staff. Um, uh, Vanessa, are partners allowed to be with you from the beginning of the induction? So Vanessa, again, this is one of the themes that was fed back from Maternity Voices um, partnership at the meeting yesterday, um, and we appreciate people are quite anxious about induction. So um, it depends what's happening in terms of the induction. So women who, um, who are being induced because their waters have gone um, for more than 24 hours, um, on the date that their induction is planned, they come in via our maternity assessment unit and they go to our delivery suite where they have a hormone drip. So from that point, your partner can be with you because you are going to be there um, with set members of staff until your baby is born. If you are in for an induction um, where um, you've had three babies or more before, we start that induction by breaking your waters. So um, most of the time we're able to take you straight to delivery suite, in which case your partner comes with you um, and, uh, and then your waters are broken. So yes, they're with you from the beginning of the induction. If, um, if you are having our mechanical induction and you're coming in the day before uh, uh, when you're having uh, either uh, an internal examination and a, what they call a stretch and sweep, or you're having the, um, the catheter um, put in, women are generally only in for an hour. Um, and at that time, um, we ask for partners not to come in. So at present, our plan is that partners don't come in for that. Um, women are in for about an hour, all being well can go home. If, um, if uh, there is something that we're concerned about and we feel that women should stay, then they stay on level six. Um, and then um, your partner would um, we, uh, would qualify for coming to visit you um, in one of those set one hour periods. Um, if you uh, if you go home uh, and your partner uh, and then you come back the following day to have your waters broken, um, again uh, initially um, what we do is we ask you to come. Um, at present to level six on your own, because again, that's less staff being exposed um, and the staff there will look after you, they'll break your waters. And at the time that you then go to delivery suite for the next stage of your induction, or if you go to the spires because you've gone into labor from that, then your partner will join you there. So they will join you for the main bit that you are in labor, but the bit that perhaps is the preparation side of things is when um, when they, they can't be with you. And that's just about us trying to minimise that contact with different staff groups um, of extra people. Um, sometimes there are delays in the induction process. Again, we've heard that from people, they're waiting to have their waters broken. Um, and we have said to people, you know, if you want, you can uh, go out uh, and meet your partner outside if it's a nice day, because generally that's during the day. Um, as long as we have a contact that we can phone you when the space is available on delivery suite. Um, but it is, um, it is about us trying to reduce uh, the footfall through the unit and thus exposure to different members uh, and different people. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. But again, we have heard what induction feels like, how scary it is for women, um, and is one of the key areas that we are looking at to see if there's a way that we can make any changes. Uh, so, Sadie, you said, when, what's the process for induction regarding partners being able to stay with you? Hopefully, I've just um, explained that. Um, um, uh, Karis, you said, thank you for all your help and support. Please, could you confirm that partners are allowed to come in with us when we're initially examined? Okay, so so you can. If you, if you think that you're in labour, when you're having contractions, that's at the point that we are absolutely um, able to support your partners coming in for you because we're anticipating that you, you know, we're hoping that between us, when we've had the conversations on the phone, we've got it at the right point that you need care. Um, so either when you attend uh, a midwifery led unit at, um, in the community, uh, Wallingford, Cotswold Maternity Unit, Banbury, or if you attend the Spires, it's the same thing your partner would come in with you at that point. If we felt that perhaps you benefit from more time being at home and give you some advice, um, then your partner would go home with you. Um, if you're attending um, 
because you uh, think that you're in labour, but you're planning to birth them delivery suite. Again, the maternity assessment unit are keen to try and keep you together um, for that experience. Because the maternity assessment unit sees women for other reasons, there may be, um, and they have a waiting area because they only have a defined number of, whim, of rooms. So um, if women are in the waiting area and, and, and there are more people coming in with partners, if we feel that we can't safely socially distance, then we would ask your partner um, if they could wait um, outside um, to enable us to to minimise that, you know, ensure the two metre distance and, and, and the social distancing. So uh, the, it's, it's, it's easier in the other areas, um, you know, community and the spires. On maternity assessment unit, we will try our best. It just depends how many other people um, are in the waiting area. But again, you asked the, the second part of that was about induction. I'm afraid not for induction until we're at the point that you are either going to the spires or to the delivery suite so that we're not exposing you and the staff on level six um, and then delivery suite uh, or um, the spires. Um, and again, if you were if you decided that we thought that you were still in early labour and had a little bit more time and you decided you wanted to stay in the ward, um, on level six, unfortunately, your partner wouldn't be able to stay with you. Um, but we do have midwives and maternity support workers who will do everything they can to support you. And, and luckily, women have technology which enables them to, to see and speak to their partners um, for that added support. Um, but, you know, again, a pathway we absolutely are looking at. Um, so, oh gosh, I don't, my questions have run all over the place now. Um, uh, so then I have Sarah, um, you said, thank you for the update. You're just checking. I have your 36 week scan on Tuesday. Will you be doing this on your own? No, um, uh, Sarah, at this time, we absolutely, um, still support partners coming in for scans. It's, uh, it's very important. Um, so yes, please bring your partner with you. Um, please make sure you obviously adopt hand hygiene, try not to touch too many things. Um, there's lots of alcohol gel available. Please wear your mask and please wear your mask properly so that they're covering your nose um, and your mouth for both of you. Um, the ultrasonographers will be very clear about where you can wait, uh, where you can queue, uh, where your partner can stand um, to enable the social distancing to occur. Some of our rooms are quite small, some are bigger than others. Um, but obviously we need to be able to use all our rooms uh, to be able to offer full screening for everyone. Uh, Natalie, you're asking, are birth partners allowed in for the induction process at all? I think I've answered that. I've gone through induction, I think, in quite a lot of detail in terms of the, the different um, points um, that we just chatted about. Um, uh, Friday, you say, what's the situation with partners coming in and staying with us for inductions? Again, I think you might have posted that after I just uh, talked about inductions. Uh, uh, Kelly says, can you please explain the rules around induction, both the pessary and induction and the drip induction and when partners are allowed in each of the scenarios? Again, I think Carly, I've, I've um, sorry, Kelly, I think I've answered that uh, in terms of we talked about if women's waters had broken, what that would mean if they were just having their waters broken, what that would mean. Um, and it's at the point, at the point that you move to a birth environment is when your partners can can come and stay with you. And and women aren't, you know, at that point, it's it's rare for women to be in, in having painful contractions at that point. Um, so, you know, we do, it's really important for you to update your partner on what's happening, because I think on the second day of the mechanical induction, when women are returning to have their waters broken, because there can be a delay, it isn't always possible to break them on the time that you were given. Um, um, because obviously it depends how many women have gone into natural labour and we want to make sure you have a midwife that is with you um, and can provide that one-to-one -one care. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, partners, um, 
may have some weight. So it's important for you to keep them up to date with what's happening. Um, uh, we will keep you up to date in terms of the delay. Our induction team are amazing. Um, and, you know, please, they, you know, ask them questions. They will answer them for you um, to make sure that we're, we're being as realistic as we can be um, in terms of timing for going downstairs. Um, you know, there have been a cases when partners have waited all day outside in their car um, we'll be able to tell you at the beginning of the day whether there's likely to be a delay uh, or not to try and give them a bit more time because it may be more suitable for them to go home um, and return uh, later on. Because even at the point that we break your waters, it's not always, um, you know, it's, it's not then immediate that you go to either delivery suite or the spires from there. So there is time for your partner to return um, to be with you. Um, uh, so, Bridie, you've asked, can your partner stay for the entire birth? That is from four centimetres right up to the birth, and how long can they stay afterwards? So, um, Bridie, that was the bit that I was saying um, at the beginning. Um, yes, your partner, from when you go into the birth environment, whether it's in one of our community units, uh, whether it's the spires, whether it's delivery suite, when you are admitted and are having one-to-one -one care with the midwife, that is when your partner will stay with you. They will absolutely stay with you throughout the birth um, and after the baby's born. And it's only really at the point of transfer um, to um, a different uh, area, like the postnatal ward on level seven or the postnatal ward on level five, um, that your partner would go home. Because again, that's about not exposing to um, extra staff. So at present, some people have been encouraged to go home quite quickly um, and other people have had a bit longer. And what we want to try and do is, um, is look at whether there's potential to extend the time that you're on delivery suite before you transfer up to the ward. Um, so it's one of these areas that is under review, but we, we passionately want your partner to be with you for at least an hour after the birth of your baby um, and hopefully a bit longer. Um, and, and we're not set on four centimetres. That's the other thing, you know, uh, it talks about it in books. Midwives do talk about it too, um, and from people's experiences. But some women need one-to-one -one care and labour at an earlier point, and some people need more pain relief at an earlier point. So we do take that into consideration, and it's not all just about doing a vaginal examination to see how far the cervix is dilated. Uh, so, Rita, you say, if the labour happens in the spires, can the partner stay overnight as before? So, Rita, again, um, it's about exposure to different members of staff. Um, so, you know, at present, then, no, they're not able to. Um, uh, and, and we are looking at that. Um, because, obviously, if you, if you laboured um, and gave birth during the day, you will have met potentially three different midwives possibly two maternity support workers in that time. Um, so say you gave birth at 11 o'clock in the afternoon. When, when the new staff come on round about seven o'clock, they start to come in. That's a whole other different um, group of staff. So that's another three midwives and another two maternity support workers um, that are going on board. And you also have to remember that we have other staff about as well. So we have uh, our lovely housekeeper that keeps everything clean and in order. We have our cleaners that are constantly working because as women give birth and move out of the birth rooms they're constantly going in and cleaning so it's exposure of more members of our team um, and we have to look after all of them um, so at, at present the rules apply in delivery suite and the spires but i promise we will update via maternity voices partnership and update our website if we can make any changes there um, but at present sadly um, you just get to have the double bed to yourself, which is quite nice, I suppose. Um, and we will give you lots of support with feeding your baby um, and looking after you. Catherine, you said the current advice seems to be that continuous monitoring is needed for la in labour for women who are COVID positive. What's the evidence behind that? Is it different to if you had a chest infection or flu on a normal year? Um, so again, when you have an infection, uh, Catherine, and you have a temperature, uh, and we can find this in women in normal labour, if you have a temperature that's above 37.5, 
Your baby is at least half a degree to a degree hotter than you, so they don't like it. Babies are much like us. If, if, um, if we get too hot, we get disgruntled, we get uncomfortable, um, and sometimes a bit intolerant. And babies are the same. So if your temperature is up, then baby's temperature was, uh, is up. And that's why we have you in hospital. Um, we, um, we want to give you IV antibiotics to try and bring your temperature down to help to keep you well and to bring that temperature down for the baby because the baby is too hot. So if you have a baby that is too hot, they will get stressed. Um, um, and that's why the continuous monitoring is there to be able to um, monitor exactly what's happening with the baby. Because you're not a, you know, the, the difference between continuous monitoring and intermittent monitoring is about a well mum versus, you know, and a not well mum or a not well baby. Um, so, you know, we, we recommend um, the monitoring that, that gives us the, the most information about, you know, um, about a baby that's um, perhaps going to be suffering because the mum is unwell. And as you've identified, it's similar to people who have, if you have a chest infection or if you have flu and you have a high temperature, it's associated with that. Um, Melanie, you've, uh, you, you're having a COVID swab, but previously didn't have it done in theatre, you had it done in a delivery room. Um, you previously didn't have it done in theatre, you had it done. Um, ideally, a COVID swab for women that we know are going to stay, so women in labour, or, or women who are coming in to have a planned caesarean section, um, or, or women, so the planned caesarean section is different because you, it's done three days before, but if you're, if you're coming in and you're going to stay, so you're going to be based, you're going to be moved to our antenatal ward or you're going to be moved to our postnatal ward or to the spire, you're in the spires or delivery suite, you should ideally have the COVID swab taken at the point that you come into hospital. Now, for women that come in and establish labour, it can be very difficult to, uh, you, you're concentrating on the most important thing at that time sometimes is, is helping facilitate that birth because it's happening so quickly. Um, but, uh, and then the COVID swab will be taken afterwards. Um, but it's key that the COVID swab is done as soon as you're clinically stable enough for us to do it. So if you came in, I'm not sure whether you came in and you were taken straight to theatre, um, the priority would have been about the safety of you and the baby. Um, and then afterwards, it is crucial to have that so that that informs us. But at the time, it was more important to make sure that you and the baby were well. So it really depends. It, it should be done as soon as possible into your admission when you uh, or the baby are, are at a point that it is safe to do so. I hope I hope that answers your question. If not, please do repose it. Um, uh, Leah, you said, when will we be allowed to have um, uh, two birth partners? Has this been reviewed? So, Leah, I think much like the conversation we've been having today, this is again about having an additional person there, additional exposure um, for our midwifery team, our maternity support workers, our doctors who are looking after you. Um, so, you know, it's not something that I see changing in, 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 you know, in the near future because I think there have been more areas identified where people feel that they, that they want it focused on. Um, so, you know, you've always been able to have one partner, which is fantastic. So we know for that period of time that you're in labour and giving birth to your baby, you have had a visitor with you the whole time for support. So there has been somebody that's been able to be there for you. I think the women on the postnatal ward are really struggling because they don't have that person there with them all the time. And they are dependent on our staff. And if everybody's dependent on our staff, as much as we've put lots of staff on level five to make it easier, those women feel like that they are the priority because actually they're, they've not got anybody there with them. And obviously their partners are missing those key moments of that newborn baby and, and the feeding and the soothing and, and all those uh, things that are so important to new parents. So I think in, in the priority line of things, I think in introducing an extra birth partner is not a priority when we have to look at so many other areas where there's no birth partners whatsoever, um, you know, where there's no um, partners being allowed. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's not a theme that's come strongly from the feedback that we've received, because I think people are just so pleased that they can have one partner there throughout. Um, 
uh, so um, yeah, it, it's um, you know it is something obviously that will be part of our recovery plan. But I think our key focus has to be looking at uh, the anxiety that women are are experiencing in the induction process, the anxiety that new mums are experiencing on the postnatal ward, and that need for the contact with their partners. Um, so in terms of staging things, um, will be looked at. But Lee, I don't think it's going to be looked at in the near future. Uh, so, um, I think Jessica, we've covered the how long can birth partners be allowed to stay after the war after the birth. It really depends on how long you stay in one clinical area before you move to another. Um, uh, Rebecca, we're expecting twins. Will the visiting time from my partner be split between me and both babies? Uh, so, no, Rebecca, when, you're, when your partner comes to see you, they're coming to see you and your two babies. Um, Rebecca, I'd like to reassure you that we have had raised um, from women who have had twins that they feel that they need some additional support um, um, and um, you know, we we have listened. We are looking at it, um, um, but at present, you know, your partner. It's not per baby. Your partner is coming for that time to be with you. Um, uh, but we appreciate you've got two babies. They need to spend time with, and especially you. Um, so you are one of our of our pathways that is. Um, we've received a lot of feedback from, um, and we're looking at how we can um, we can help to make it. Um, easier for you because obviously having more babies is is more pressure on you. Uh, oh, sorry, Rebecca, you've asked. It, you, that's about if they go into NICU. Um, Rebecca, I'm not the expert on what's happening in the neonatal unit because I think as as you can see in maternity, we're making changes along the way. And even when I checked our website today, I, I wasn't sure it was exactly reflective. I think we're doing more than it says on our website. Um, the um the neonatal unit will give you much more information if you're planning birth uh, if the birth is planned prematurely um for twins um uh then um then there will be more information available but you know what that's not very fair so what i will do the two things i have to follow up on today then so far are finding out what happens in terms of cervical stitch um, and I will contact the neonatal unit for you and see if I can get an update on what it means um, for twins if they go to the neonatal unit. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question for you just now, but I will get them to post something later on. Oh, thank you, Kerry. Um, uh, it's lovely to get some positive comments. Um, Mark, you've said also, are patients allowed to leave the ward for fresh air. Um, so so uh, patients can uh, leave the ward to go and have some fresh air. Um, we ask you very much if, um, you know, uh, for partners that come in to be with um, women in labour, um, we ask you please to try and bring provisions for yourself in terms of food and drinks to keep you hydrated and minimise the time that you are in and out of the room um, and thus in and out of the ward. Um, so, so those are uh, really important. Um, but, but people do go outside for fresh air. I know that the induction women go outside, um, uh, you know, if they've got some delay in the process and going downstairs, and that's when they go out and go for a walk with their partner. Um, but yes, um, I'm hoping you're not meaning smoking, because hopefully as all new parents, neither the mum nor the partner should be smoking. So if that was a key for can they go outside to smoke, we'd rather you didn't and we'll do everything we can to help you to stop smoking. Um, Hannah, you said what are the guidelines for partners for an emergency caesarean section? So Hannah, because emergency caesarean sections happen in labour, your partner would be with you and um, that hasn't changed. Um, they'll come into theatre with you. The only time it's different, and this isn't different because of COVID, this is what happens before the pandemic as well. If you have to go to the theatre for an emergency caesarean section and they have to put you to sleep with the general anaesthetic, um, then your partners do leave the room before the leave the theatre before the general anaesthetic and they wait in the room. Um, and we try to um, join them up with their baby as soon as we can. 
Um, but um, if you are under general anaesthetic, then partners do leave theatre. But otherwise, your partners are with you. Um, part of the pathway that we're looking at just now is because women who've had a caesarean section go to our recovery ward. That's a different group of staff, which then makes it is a different group of staff that then have exposure to your partner. Um, so it is something that we have under review because um, women who've been to theatre um, are finding they, they have less time with their partner um, after the baby's born. Uh, Debbie, uh, you've said, is it normal for a caesarean incision to bleed occasionally seven weeks post-section? One end of the seven incision still bleeds sometimes. Um, uh, Debbie, it might be that some, some uh, as the stitches are dissolving, um, that there's uh, that there's maybe an area that's trying to heal from the outside in. Sometimes uh, it can be that there's an area of infection. Um, Debbie, I would recommend that that you talk to your GP about it, um, because they may want to look at it just to see whether they think there might be an infection. Um, but um, it's not a common occurrence. It's not something that I've not heard. I have obviously heard about it before, but it's very difficult to do it uh, via this medium. It would be much better if you could uh, get your GP uh, to have a look at it. I'm sorry you're having problems. Uh, Krista, you said if your partner has COVID symptoms but a negative test result, are they allowed to come into hospital for labour visiting? So if you feel that your partner has COVID symptoms, but they have had a swab since they've had their symptoms and the swab is negative, um, then um, then that they, then they don't have COVID. Um, they, um, but if your partner feels unwell, um, and it, you know, because it's only testing for COVID, if your partner has a cough, um, then we have to think about, you know, other things uh, because coming into winter there will be other things and as children go back to school and back to nursery there are other things so I think if your partner feels unwell then they shouldn't come into hospital um, we, we do try and encourage people uh, to stay at home at that point um, so that you're minimizing exposure um, to people of whatever your partner has but if they've had if they have symptoms of COVID and the test is negative then it isn't COVID but it may be other things and it is about um, keeping everyone safe uh, also, there, there's, there's nothing worse than if somebody has a cough. I choked on water and started coughing and everybody looked at me like I, you know, I had some, you know, I had the deadly disease and actually I had just cough, coughed on water. So you don't get a very good response if you start coughing um, out and about. Uh, Shannon, are partners allowed to come to scans? Yes. Uh, uh, Holly, you're saying with a planned caesarean, is there a chance that mum and baby will only stay in one night? Yes, all being well, we try to get you home the following day. Um, it obviously depends how you are and how the baby is. Um, one of the um, uh, issues with a planned caesarean section, one of the higher risks in terms of getting women home, is that babies sometimes struggle to transition in terms of their breathing and, and can have an admission to the neonatal unit. Um, so that can prolong um, the time that you stay in hospital. It's something that's more common in women who have a planned caesarean section. Um, we need to make sure that your baby's breathing is OK. Obviously, baby being back with you, baby having fed before you go home um, and also the complications that you can occur. Uh, most of the time, the surgery is straightforward, but because obviously there can be complications with the surgery, if there are any difficulties during the surgery, it would depend on when we could send you home. Uh, so we Home until we think that you are physically well enough to go home, uh, both you and the baby. Um, so, uh, um, uh, oh, so Debbie, you've replied to Holly, you had a baby on the Friday at 2 or 3 pm and you were home Saturday at 6 30. Yeah, so you've answered my question. So you did it for me. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, Justina. How far in, along in dilatation would you need to be for your partner to join you during induction? Justina, isn't about how dilated your cervix is. It's about whether you need um, whether you need care um, in terms of you started contracting, um, and then at that point that you moved to the delivery suite or the spires. 
that's when your partner comes to stay with you or if you're going for the next part of your induction so if you're not contracting but you're going to the to the delivery suite to have the hormone drip started that's the point that your husband uh, your husband's partner um, uh, um, comes to stay with you so it isn't done in the dilatation of your cervix it's more of what is the next bit what's the bit of care that you need um, to happen uh, Vicky thank you for thanking us um, you you saying as someone who's in the shielding group for non-pregnant related conditions you find everything I've said reassuring due date's been and gone so hopefully be up to have baby on spire soon excellent Vicky come and kick me out today um, I'm in Burkot at present so please come up we will happily see you get that baby out um, and I'm glad you found this helpful um, uh, Kylie our husband's allowed to stay overnight when you're in active labour uh, yeah, uh, they, Kylie, they stay with you until that baby's born. Uh, they have to stay awake. If they're there, make sure they're awake. No, I'm kidding. If they're tired and you're snoozing, because some people snooze, then partners will snooze too. But Kylie, they absolutely stay with you um, until your um, baby is born and, and for a short time afterwards. Uh, Natalie, are there any different allowances for Silver Star pregnancies? Um, uh, uh, there, you know, I think we. Um, it, it's not. It's not so much about different pregnancies, um, Natalie. I mean, if you're on delivery suite, that's when your partner stays with you. So I'm. I'm really sorry, but if you're based on the levels, if you're based on level six uh, as a Silver Star patient antenatally, then you will get your visit one uh, for an hour a day, um, which I know is not ideal, but it's something. Um, but when when you are requiring care in the delivery suite or on the spires, that's when your partner stays with you. Um, so I appreciate that if you're an inpatient antenatally, it could be really difficult and really stressful for you. But um, I'm sorry, it's just about that exposure of, of everyone round about you um, and um, our staff. Uh, uh, so, Karis... Uh, Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's really lovely that you appreciate it because I feel like I'm not telling you really what you want to hear, but I do just want to let you know that we're trying everything we can to keep running a really great service um, um, and keep our staff at work and keep you all as safe as possible. Uh, okay, Holly, uh, you're having a uh, twins and being told it will be a cesarean section at 32 to 34 weeks and babies will go to NICU. Uh, uh, so you've asked about um, that. I, Holly, uh, I'm, I know that you said you joined late and you missed it. I'm going to update in terms of twins in the neonatal unit um, um, after today once I've gone and spoken to the neonatal unit. So hopefully I'll have an answer for you then. Oh, what have I done? Um, I'm just going to flick through some of them just to see if there's anything else because I'm, I'm acutely aware you've heard me droning on in my Glasgow accent for an hour and 20 minutes um, and I had better go and, and do some work or they'll be complaining about me too. Um, uh, so, oh, Debbie, that, that was about your caesarean section wound. I'm, I'm sure it will clean up. If you've had an infection, it's cleared up occasional bleeding, no pain, discomfort, I'm sure it will just clear up. It's just probably the end of the infection. But if you have any concerns because you've had the infection before, you know what it's like, please do um, please do go and um, see your GP about it. Uh, Cara, you said, what's the quickest that a first time mum can go home after the birth if there is, is there a minimum time that you have to stay in for? No, Cara. I think the biggest frustration for women after you've had a baby is is you feel well and you think this is great I can do this I can go home for us we have to write notes uh, and we have to send in a computer we have to complete a computerized record as well as handwritten notes to enable you to notify your baby's birth etc afterwards so I think people get frustrated with us that we're slow with our notes um, and sometimes when we're trying to write your notes we're asked to go and do other things uh, like help somebody breastfeed or or um, you know, answer a telephone call or something like that. So, so I'd say to you, we'll try and get you home as soon as we can. Um, from your perspective, 
we like you to um, have passed urine and be happy we'll, that your temperature, your pulse, your blood pressure are all right and that your bleeding's not too heavy. Um, and from the baby's perspective, that the baby is okay, uh, that they don't have any issues with their breathing, that they've transitioned from inside you to outside you and that they've had a feed. Um, and then about how you plan to feed your baby. Um, we want to make sure that you're confident if you're going home that you've got breastfeeding support at home. Some people have mums, friends, partners that are really um, able to help with feeding. Other people are planning to bottle feed. You know, have you got you know, all the equipment? Are you sure about making up the feeds? All of those kind of things. We just want to make sure that you know, there's not anything additional that you may need. Um, for women who are breastfeeding and it's their first time, quite often it's better for them to stay for a night um, to have that extra support um, uh, from the staff that are here. Um, but obviously it can be anything. I've, I've known people rush me through my notes uh, in a couple of hours and being out the door and for other people it's, it's three or four or five or six. Um, it's very different uh, depending on what's happening. Um, because I'm sure as you can appreciate, once you've had the baby, there's not quite as rush for a midwife to stay with you all the time. And if somebody needs a midwife because they're still in labour, um, we may get pulled to them. But we will bear with us. Record keeping is the biggest um, pain of our lives and the biggest delay for you, even on the postnatal ward especially. Um, so we try everything we can to do it as quickly as possible. Bridie, will both myself and my partner be swabbed for COVID before we enter maternity assessment unit when coming in for assessment? Or is swabbing only done a few days before the caesarean? So we don't swab before an induction. So women are swabbed for induction when they come in for induction. Women are swabbed for caesarean, a planned caesarean section three days before it. And women who come in in labour um, are swabbed on the maternity assessment unit and we don't swab your partners. Um, because we kind of feel that you're together with them and if we swab you um, and, and you're negative then your partner will be negative or that's an assumption probably. Um, uh, Jessica, sorry, sun shining my screen, you had your little boy at 4.52 and you were home by 10. Oh, great, you're all answering the questions for me which is fantastic. Excellent, I think I've come to the end of the questions and before anybody poised um, poses even some more questions I'm going to end it there so I hope our key messages are we are listening you're doing the right things um, and um, you know you're telling us we are listening and we are going to do everything we can to make some changes and make it a positive experience um, we're responding to you all the time um, so please bear with us um, and um, I hope you're sessions that you have with our infant feeding team on a Thursday afternoon and that you've enjoyed seeing the community midwives on the other Facebook lives. So I'm going to finish there and wish you all well um, and I, I promise we will update maternity voices um, as we move along um, and I'll get them to answer those two questions uh, later. So thank you all. Bye.